in listen only mode. Hi everyone, welcome and thanks for joining us this afternoon for today's webinar, Understanding California's Regional Centers from Yesterday to Today and Tomorrow. Before I introduce our speaker, I'd like to let you know a little bit about Family Voices of California. FECA is a statewide coalition of locally based parent run centers working to ensure children and youth with special health care needs receive quality care. As the state affiliate of National Family Voices, we're California's federally funded family to family health information center and we provide support to families of children with special needs. These webinars serve as statewide trainings on various child health topics and are geared toward families, professionals, and parent-to-parent -parent resource staff and advocates. If you have any technical difficulties today, you can go ahead and call GoToWebinar directly at the number on your screen. Due to feedback issues, we have everyone on mute from our end. Throughout the webinar, please feel free to type in any questions in the appropriate box on the right-hand side of your menu. We'll stop periodically throughout the presentation to address them and also save some time at the end for additional questions. Today's presentation is being recorded and will be posted on the F FEC website, FA website, along with the PowerPoints. Afterward, you'll be emailed a short evaluation survey, and we thank you in advance for taking the time to give us some invaluable feedback about today's presentation. It's now my pleasure to introduce our wonderful speaker, Amy Wessling. Amy is the Executive Director of the Association of Regional Center Agencies, or ARCA. She joined ARCA in 2012 and has focused on services for children at risk of de developmental disabilities, accessing health insurance funding for autism services, and the funding needs of California's developmental services system. Prior to that, she worked for Alta California Regional Center, coordinating the movement of individuals with developmental disabilities from institutional to community settings, and for Central Valley Regional Center, overseeing services, service coordination in rural Merced and Mariposa counties. I'm gonna go ahead and turn it over to Amy now. So thank you guys. Thank you so much. It's a pleasure to be with you all today, and I really appreciate that you all carved an hour out of your busy schedules to learn more about the regional centers, their history, where we are today, and where we think we're headed. Today, we're going to cover three things. We're gonna cover the history of the developmental services system in California. I'm a firm believer that we can't really appreciate where we are or where we're going without understanding where we've been. So we'll spend about a third of today's presentation talking about the history and the philosophy behind regional centers. The next thing that we will address is what today's service system looks like. Again, it's important to understand uh, where we are right now and where we think we're headed, which is the last issue um, that we will address today, which are, which are issues that are on the horizon that may shape future services. And we'll talk about challenges as well as opportunities in that arena. A couple of disclaimers and uh, just at the outset of the webinar, wanted to let you know that at the beginning of our system, we use the term mental retardation as a clinical diagnosis. I've taken the liberty of updating the language that appears in statutes, even in the historical pieces, to reflect today's modern term, which is intellectual disability. I also wanted to let you know that I'll be pausing twice during today's webinar to take questions so that I can ensure that everyone that's taking their time to participate in the webinar get something out of this and really has their needs met as well. So I will pause after the second piece of the webinar, after the review of what the service system looks like today, and I'll also take questions at the end after we've addressed future issues. So without further ado, let's get started. As you know, California began as a frontier state. And with the population that settled California, 
it wasn't a terribly professionalized population. It was miners and those who were here to support miners. And just like every other community and every other civilization, California had people with developmental disabilities living uh, in its population. And it wasn't long, it was really the mid to late 1800s, that the state began to contemplate how should we provide treatment and care to this population that needed assistance. So in the late 1800s, the state opened its first developmental center. And up until the 1960s, that was really the model of care. It was a medical model of care that focused on providing care and supervision to meet individual's needs. And that's how we continued on until the mid 1960s. But by the 1960s, California had over 13,000 individuals with developmental disabilities in these institutional settings. And there were thousands more on the waiting list for admission. At this time, there weren't options aside from institutional care. So if a family had a child born with a disability, they were given really two options. The first was to place their child into a developmental center. And the second option was really to care for that child 24 seven on their own. There weren't a lot of social systems in place at the time to, uh, to provide support to the family. In fact, children at this time with disabilities weren't even entitled to special to edu public education. The 1960s were an integral time in the field of treatment of individuals with disabilities, both nationally and here in California. John F. Kennedy was president of the United States. And he had a sister with a developmental disability. And his other sister, Eunice Shriver Kennedy, began the national dialogue and drew attention to the issue of individuals with developmental disabilities. In a 1963 speech, President John F. Kennedy said that in caring for individuals with disabilities, we have to offer, offer something more than crowded custodial care in our state institutions. And that began a dialogue at the national level. Now at this time, the federal government would participate in the funding for services provided in institutional medical uh, models, but not in, for community services. And so there was the beginning of a, an important conversation in this field. If you want more information about um, about this movement as a, at a national level. There is a uh, film that is available. It's a brief film uh, that tracks this uh, and really traces the dialogue that, uh, that President Kennedy began. And um, it's available online. And I'll be happy to send that information out following the webinar. So that's what was happening at a national level. In California, there was a very concerted effort around what to do to support individuals with developmental disabilities. And it really was led by families who had children with developmental disabilities. So on the right-hand side, you see a graphic um, with lots of pictures on it. And this is the cover from a um, booklet that's available online called We're Here to Speak for Justice, Founding California's Regional Centers. And there's an accompanying film that goes on for a little over an hour, maybe an hour and a half, that tells the story of California's regional center system and our community-based service system. And so I won't go into as much detail as that film, of course, but I did want to give you some high points. So some of the things that happened were three parents and a reporter for the Orange County Register visited Fairview State Hospital in the early 1960s. 
And they took a look at the institutional model of care and they began to ask questions about if that was the most appropriate way to care for individuals with developmental disabilities. And if maybe we could begin to explore other alternatives. So this visit and the subsequent story in the Orange County Register led to hearings and investigations. And a group of parents organized around this issue and began to demand other options. And they began to, for lack of a better term, hound their elected officials here in Sacramento. And the one that they spent the most time and energy on and that ultimately yielded results was a gentleman by the name of Assemblymember Frank D. Lannerman. Now, Mr. Lannerman, he is pictured on the upper left um, of, that, of that group of pictures. Mr. Lannerman was an assembly member who was a conservative Republican who believed that um, less government was better and who also believe that public-private partnerships really could do a lot of the work that government had done to this point. And those points will become important later. So one of the first things that happened was there was the demand for a report to be written. That's what we do here in Sacramento when there's an issue presented, the problem is studied, and then there's a report generated. And so in 1965, a report summed up the issue and said, the heart of the problem is that most families who are unable to care for their intellectually disabled child at home have no choice other than to place the child in a state hospital. So as I mentioned earlier, there really was, it really was a forced choice. You, the family had the choice of either placing their child in a developmental center, or they had the choice of caring for that child almost entirely on their own. So following the report, there was the decision to create two pilot regional centers. In 1966, the first two regional centers were opened, the first in Los, in Los Angeles and the other in San Francisco. And the goal was to begin to explore alternatives to institutional care to meet each person's unique needs. We were beginning to understand that people and their families have different needs, even people who have the same diagnosis or the same diagnoses have unique needs because of their communities as well as their families. And in 1968, a study found that the two pilot regional centers had been successful. They had been able to provide families with the level of support they needed in order to maintain their children in the community rather than in an institutional setting and at a far lesser cost. So the parent advocates went back to assembly member Lannerman who introduced AB 225 in 1969 which was the vehicle that was used to expand the regional center statewide. As I mentioned earlier, um, Mr. Lannerman was a fan of public-private partnerships, and um, this partnership and this notion really created the regional center system and created services that allowed for uh, regional centers to reflect the needs of each community and to fill the gaps in existing services and supports for each individual family. So having worked at both Central Valley as well as Alta California Regional Center, so Central Valley uh, centered in Fresno and the greater Fresno area, as well as Alta California Regional Center centered in Sacramento and the surrounding area, I can tell you that the challenges for each center are different. Uh, Central Valley is very rural for the most part, and you know one of the big considerations is in have in how to move people from one place to another to receive the appropriate supports. So on a daily basis, how to get someone from home to uh, maybe their work site, and in Alta California catchment area, as well as some other more expensive areas of the state, there are additional challenges related to 
how services are funded as well as um, how to provide services in a more urban setting. So in 1978, the expansion of the regional center system was completed and the 21st regional center opened. At that time, the expectation was that for every million Californians, there would be a new regional center opened. Um, today, we have about 39 million regional, I'm sorry, we have about 39 million Californians, which would mean that today we'd, we would have 39 regional centers, but we decided to stop at 21. And so those boundaries have remained relatively similar for the last uh, almost 40 years. So additional important developments in the system. In 1973, um, again, Assemblymember Lannerman wrote legislation to expand the services of regional centers to individuals with other developmental disabilities other than intellectual disability. And so there were opportunities for people who had cerebral palsy, epilepsy, autism, and other conditions closely related to intellectual disability to join the regional center system. In 1983, California began to receive federal funding for its community-based system. This was a huge deal, and we'll talk more about what federal dollars mean to us today. But up until that point, almost the entire system was funded on entirely state dollars. Another huge development for us was in 1985. There was a lawsuit that really stemmed from a California fiscal crisis. And at that time, the question that was raised was in case of fiscal crisis, can the services that individuals receive through the regional centers be scaled back in response to that crisis. And what the California Supreme Court said was that the Lanterman Act, quote, defines a basic right and corresponding basic obligation. The right which it grants to the developmentally disabled person is to be provided with services that enable him to live in a more, live a more independent and productive life in the community. The obligation which it imposes on the state is to provide such services. And this really established the entitlement to services that we know today. And the entitlement to services in California is one of the things that we're very proud of. We are the only state that has, that will provide needed developmental services to any resident of our state, regardless of eligibility for Medi-Cal, known as Medicaid in other states and without a waiting list. In some states in the country, the wait for services can exceed a decade. So this was an essential piece of what made us what we are today. Additional developments um, in 1993 in what was known as the Caulfield Settlement forced the state and the state agreed to um, begin a larger scale movement of individuals from developmental centers into the community. In fact, more than 2,000 people were moved from state-run developmental centers to the community over a five-year period. And since that time, we've seen the closure of several of the remaining developmental centers. So just briefly, I wanna talk about where we are today, what the system looks like today, what its goals and aims are, and some of the things that are driving service delivery as we know it. As I mentioned, there are now 21 regional centers and they support now more than 300,000 individuals with developmental disabilities. Each regional center continues to be an independent nonprofit overseen by a volunteer board of directors. And what this means is that the regional centers are responsive not only to the state, the funding sources, the Department of Developmental Services, but they are also res directly responsive to their local communities because community members comprise the volunteer board of directors. Today, approximately half of the individuals that regional center supports are adults and the other half are children. Regional centers have three big goals. 
um, that really guide service delivery. So in the early 90s, the regional center system was expanded to include um, the Early Start program, which is for infants and toddlers at risk of developmental disability. And so for those infants and toddlers, the aim is to help as many of them as possible to catch up to their same age peers through therapies and through early interventions. For children supported by the regional center system, it is to help them to remain in their family home. And for adults, it's to help them to become as independent as possible. Service delivery in the regional center system is driven by individual need. And it's through a cyclical planning process that each individual's needs are determined and then addressed and then evaluated. So the first thing that a service coordinator, who is the individual that helps to coordinate services for each individual supported by a regional center, so the first thing that a service coordinator may ask a family or the individual themselves is what are your hopes and dreams? And those hopes and dreams really then go to setting measurable goals and setting shorter term objectives. So if the goal is that an individual will um, achieve employment, then uh, an objective could be something along the lines of in the next 12 months, the individual will explore various job sites or will explore their interests or something along those lines. So the next step is to explore the available resources. Regional centers were developed to fill in those gaps in available resources. And so when determining what services are appropriate to begin to address the goals and objectives, one of the first steps is to explore resources that the individual has at their disposal, either through natural resources. So we all have friends and families and communities that help us to achieve things. And so we look at what, where are those things um, and what are those available resources that the individual has at their disposal. So if the individual wants a job and the family maybe knows someone who runs a small business, would connecting those two individuals make sense? The next thing that we look at in terms of available resources are other government funded programs or programs funded through health insurance or those sorts of things. And those can include things such as in-home supportive services. It can include um, medical therapies available through health insurance, a variety of other things, including educational services provided through the school system. So once we identify where the available resources are, we look <clears throat> Excuse me. We look at where uh, where are the remaining gaps, and then purchase services to fill those remaining needs. And following this process, then we, after a while, begin to monitor progress towards meeting those goals we established at the beginning, and the process repeats itself. So this is a process called person-centered planning, and. The federal government has a fantastic definition of person-centered planning that I just wanted to share with you. And their definition is the person-centered service plan must reflect the services and supports that are important for the individual, as well as what is important to the individual. So we tend to think of things that are important for the individual as including those things that are important to maintain health and safety. So it is important for an individual to receive their medication. We think of those things that are important to the individual as those quality of life things that we all care about, those things that make it so that we want to get up in the morning and face the day. So it could be that it is important to an individual to begin their day with a cup of coffee. Their health won't suffer adverse effects if they don't but they certainly will not be as happy and um, won't feel as fulfilled if they don't get that. 
So person-centered planning is really about, in a very small nutshell, finding a balance between what is important to maintain the health and safety of the individual, as well as to um, enable the person to pursue things that they really are interested in and um, to live in a way where they have a tremendous amount of choice in their life. We couldn't get through a webinar like this without talking about money. And so I mentioned at the outset that in the 1960s, when the system was established, the uh, federal government did not play a role in funding the system for the most part. And then in the 1980s, we began to receive federal dollars for the system. So in this current fiscal year, which began July 1st, 2017, and will run through June 30th, 2018, the total community-based budget for regional center operations, as well as those services that they purchase from service providers who have the day-to-day -day contact with um, individuals, is $6.4 billion. And I apologize, I didn't update that slide to say 1718, but I believe these are 1718 numbers. So total federal reimbursement is $2.6 billion. So those are the federal funds. So 41% of our system come, of the funding for our system comes from the federal government. And so it is incumbent upon us in order to continue to receive federal dollars to um, follow the rules that the federal government has established. So they have expectations about service delivery that we'll get into a little bit later, but I just wanted to provide you with that context of why what the federal government is interested in is so essential to us here in California. And then just briefly before we move on to taking questions, I wanted to talk about current trends that are impacting our system today. So our system has seen quite an evolution since it was founded more than 50 years ago. We are seeing higher rates of autism. We are seeing individuals living longer than their aging family members can support them. This is really the first population of individuals who, for whom a caretaker has to consider what happens to this individual when I can no longer be there to take care of them? We have to think about individuals with multiple diagnoses. So there are people in our system who have very, very complex needs. About 24% of the people that are supported by regional centers have medical needs in addition to their developmental disability. About 11% also have a psychiatric disability in addition to their developmental disability. We also um, know that California is becoming an increasingly diverse state. And so we have to think about how can we best support people where they are? How can we support them in a culturally sensitive way? We know that today, 76, almost 77% of individuals supported by regional centers live at home with their families. We know that 95% of people uh, supported by regional centers speak either Spanish or English, but we know that over 40 different languages are spoken within our service system. And we know, for instance, that people have additional support needs. For instance, over 500 individuals supported by regional centers communicate using American Sign Language. We know also that as the times have changed, that individuals and their families are interested in more and more individualized services. They want to ensure that the services that they receive are truly a good fit for the goals and objectives that they have. And with that, I'll be happy to take some questions. Hi, Amy. Thanks so much. Um, we have a few here. And the first question um, is, do other states have regional centers, or is it just in California due to the Lanterman Act? So every state in the nation has a system to support individuals with developmental disabilities. But California's regional centers are unique. 
um, in most other states, there, the service delivery is done either through the State Department of Developmental Services or through the counties. Um, but only in a couple of other places are there entities that resemble regional centers. And um, it's because of the Lanterman Act that we have this unique structure. Great, thank you. Um, and then another question is referring to slide 16, um, and it asks, is a presenter saying that regional centers only pay for services, DME, et cetera, if every other state agency has refused to pay? Slide 16, yes. Um, so regional centers were established to really help individuals and their families to to navigate some of those systems, but also to fill in the gaps in um, those systems. And it was a premise at the beginning of the Lanterman Act. Um, in fact, I have an original copy of the Lanterman Act on my desk, um, and it's only about 15 pages, and our current one is about 300. Um, so it's been there since the beginning of, of the Lanterman Act, but it's also a federal funding requirement. So regional centers operate and receive most of their federal dollars through a funding mechanism called a waiver. Um, and a waiver is only available to fund things that aren't available, for instance, through Medi-Cal. Um, so you have to have assurance that, for instance, Medi-Cal or in-home supportive services won't fund something in order to be able to build a federal government for it through our program. Okay, thank you. And then and the next question that we have refers to um, what could happen if federal funding is impacted? And there was another question that um, specifically speaks to um, regional center funding if the new tax bill passes and how mm -hmm. community home-based services um, may be eliminated. Right, and I'm actually going to get to some of those questions a little bit later, so if we could hold off, that would be great. Okay, perfect. Um, are you ready for a couple more? Sure. Okay, um, let's see here. If a client is also served by CCS, uh, does his or her regional center providers work with CCS providers to ensure all their needs and timely access to care, et cetera, are met? Yes, uh, there, is an, there is an attempt to try to coordinate all of those services um, and really identify who is going to do what. Um, we recognize that working with lots of systems is complicated and is time consuming, um, you know, especially when you start to blend systems that have different standards and different expectations. So timely access is something that is in the CCS world as a definition, um, but regional centers certainly operate under timelines as well. So there is an attempt to try to help families uh, navigate the systems, not just the regional center system, but other systems as well, um, and to try to identify how the services regional centers provide can be integrated with existing other services. Okay, thank you. And someone else asks, since California's population has grown so large, is it time to start thinking about building some new regional centers to increase access and decrease wait time? So one of the things that regional centers are monitored to is whether they are, um, their intake timelines. And each year regional centers um, have, a, have an intake completion um, in, in line with the timelines over 95%. So it's not an issue of, lack of access or wait times generated by the number of regional centers. And if you think back to what things were like in the 1960s, we've moved into a much more digital electronic age where information can be passed across broad geographic areas much, much faster. 
Um, some of the issues with service delivery and with uh, wait times for actual services um, may be related to the rates that regional centers are able to pay service providers. So I've heard lots of conversations, but um, nothing that would suggest that there's the plan to develop additional regional centers at this time. Okay, um, and then just one more question and then we'll move on. If um, This person asks, you mentioned different regional centers having different challenges and populations. How much consistency is required amongst regional centers? For example, something that one covers but another is saying they don't cover. Who manages resolving inconsistencies? So each regional center develops its own purchase of service policies, which are all approved by the Department of Developmental Services. And it's important to know that we step back and we go back to um, that service delivery really begins with the identification of need and then the identification of services and supports to address that need. Um, and each regional center's purchase of service policies do include an exception policy, um, but it's really a question of, I, I used to uh, always hate to think of it in terms of a service as the goal. So if the real issue is, are, is the person receiving the level of support that they need to achieve their goals? And it may look a little bit different. It may feel a little bit different in different areas. Um, but if at the end of the day, the supports are there to help the person achieve their goals and to move in that direction, that's really the, um, the focus of the system. Okay, thank you. We did have a couple of questions left, but I can save those for the next break uh, for the sake of the presentation. So thank you. Thank you so much. So now we'll move on to some of those future looking questions and thinking about where are we headed? So over time, we've evolved as a system and we've evolved as a society as well. So the federal government really, I think I mentioned, funds regional center services through something called a waiver. And the waiver is known as a home and community-based services waiver. And really, it's to provide services in a community. And over time, the federal government's definition of waiver, or, I'm sorry, of community, as well as our understanding of community, has evolved. So, once upon a time when we were moving people, uh, first moving people out of developmental centers, community just meant that you were receiving services outside of the walls of a state institution. And then we sat with that definition for a bit. And then next, about 20 years ago, we started to think about how to make community mean more and how to make sure that when we said someone lived in the community, that it didn't feel like just a smaller version of an institutional setting. And so we started to talk about what makes a, a residential setting home-like? What makes it feel like home? Is it the ability to decorate your room? Is it the ability to access uh, snacks? Is it what are those features? And now the federal government in 2014 pushed a little further. And they said that community means that services must be integrated in and support full access to the greater community. So when we say community now, what we're beginning to think about is that individuals with developmental disabilities should have the same access to their communities that you or I have. And that's an important evolution. And while change may feel slow, it's impressive to see in the last 50 years how far we've come in that. Additionally, the federal government is asking us to think about work. So work, as we know, is more than just a paycheck. Work means something to all of us. So oftentimes when I meet someone for the first time, the first question out of their mouth is, what do you do? 
works gives us identity, it gives us social circles, it gives us the ability to um, purchase things, which gives us more freedom and more choice. And so in the last few years, there have been expectations um, at both the state and federal level related to trying to help people with developmental disabilities to more successfully integrate into the workforce. And for instance, in 2011, the federal government said that the time that people spend training for work should be time limited. In 2014, the federal government came out with the Workforce Innovation and Opportunities Act, which said that integration in a work setting isn't just being in a setting where there's people without disabilities as well, but it really means working alongside peers in the same job and having the same opportunities for advancement. So again, we continue to evolve and we continue to expect more from our service delivery and our system. We, as I mentioned, since the mid 90s have been working very hard to help people transition from developmental centers into other settings. And we currently are in the process of three developmental center closures uh, at this time. So for Sonoma Developmental Center up in Sonoma County, for Fairview Developmental Center in Orange County, as well as for a portion of Porterville Developmental Center in Tulare County, about halfway between Fresno and Bakersfield. And these developmental center closures mean a few things. It means that we're moving people into more integrated settings in the community and more individualized settings um, to meet their needs. But it also means that we in the community are having to develop new models of care to support this population. So we've developed models of care to support people with complex medical and behavioral support needs. And it also means that we need to think about how we can support people to stay in the community. The developmental centers, while they oftentimes had residents who had been there for a very long time, they also served as sort of the placement of last resort if people were really struggling to maintain community placement. And so as a result of the um, pending closure of these centers, we're doing a lot of development and thinking about how best to support people who would otherwise struggle to maintain community placement and to best support them in the community. Additionally, in 2013, Governor Brown signed a bill that created uh, the building blocks for what's known as the self-determination program. And the self-determination program really is designed to give in individuals and their families more choice, responsibility, and control, and much more flexibility in terms of service delivery by allowing families and individuals to select and purchase services through, uh, through service providers who may not be part of the traditional regional center service delivery system. So for instance, if there's someone in an individual's community who would be a good fit, but for helping the person to seek a job or to um, recreate in the community, then those things could be achieved through someone who isn't part of the standard regional center um, service delivery system. People will still have the choice to use established service providers known as vendors, but they won't have to for the most part. And Again, we see here the theme that person-centered thinking and planning is central to this process. So we really, in order to determine how best to uh, support individuals in an individualized way, need to really understand what are their goals, what are their drives, what are their desires, and how can we come together to find things that will meet their needs um, in, a best, in a way that best suits them. So this program is uh, pending federal approval. 
So uh, I mentioned earlier that the state of California is heavily dependent on federal dollars for its developmental services system. This program will be just the same in terms of funding structure. And so when a state wants to do something different, they have to ask the federal government for permission to do that new thing. And uh, the application for this program is uh, with the federal government and the state and federal government continue to work out um, the details of it. But once approved, then this program will launch. As I mentioned a little bit earlier, I think during the question and answer portion, um, one of the challenges in California is related to our rate structure system. Um, the state is in the process of looking at vendor rates and how better to structure those, but there's some things that make doing business in California difficult. So California has among the nation's, I think the nation's highest uh, workers' comp rates. And in our field, um, workers' comp rates tend to be high because people are receiving direct um, support. Additionally, real estate costs are very high in California. And we have a lot of old funding models that need updating. And so this makes finding enough vendors at times challenging. Um, and so we're encouraged by um, the process that the state is undergoing with the contractor who is looking at how to structure a rate model that makes some sense. And that report is due to the state no later than March of 2019. During the question and answer period, someone asked about federal uncertainty and what those things might mean for our system. So we know that our system is heavily reliant on federal dollars, but we also know that we as a state are heavily reliant on federal dollars. And so there's been lots of talk and lots of discussion about what if, what if the federal government changes the way that it participates in Medicaid, which is called Medi-Cal in California? What if some of these tax reform efforts are a direct hit on our system in terms of um, one of the proposals is related to uh, whether an individual can deduct the cost of medical equipment. What if those things happen? Um, I'm very pleased that up until now, the state has really taken a long view of all of this. And while certainly has done analysis related to the potential impacts, and some of the potential impacts are huge, I'm not going to lie, um, the governor and our legislature made a decision to build this year's budget based on what we know today. Um, because there are so many iterations and so many different proposals that seem to appear overnight and then disappear, that responding to each and every one is really complicated. But we know that Medicaid funding is huge for the state of California. So not only does our system rely on it, but so does in-home supportive services, as well as some special education services, as well as um, CCS, as well as um, uh, Medi-Cal, of course. So there's a lot of things in flux and there's a lot of uncertainty. Um, and, you know, I think we're all beginning to think about and what that would look like, but nobody has really clear answers. And luckily, we are in a mode of um, not making decisions based on what we don't know today. As I mentioned earlier, the diversity of California has increased significantly since the development of the regional center system. And so we're really working as a regional center system to figure out how best to support diverse communities. As I think I mentioned earlier, of course, that means language access, but it also has to do with cultural norms. What services are families and individuals from diverse communities seeking and what would fit into um, their expectations and their desires and their goals and their objectives? 
one of the things that we know is that individuals who are non-white uh, tend to live at home with their families longer into adulthood. And we, during the last recession, there were some service limitations put into place that really impacted family support services. And those included the establishment of a cap on respite services, as well as the elimination of camp and social recreation services. So one of the legislative priorities that we had this year was the restoration, or I'm sorry, the lifting of the respite cap. And so as of uh, January 1st, 2018, the cap on respite will be lifted. Um, again, we go back to what is the appropriate level of respite or any other service, and it's needs-driven and dependent on um, the goals and objectives of that individual. So the, our top legislative priority for this year is addressing the uh, restriction on the purchase of camp and social recreation services because we want to ensure that we're supporting families um, and that for individuals living at home with their families, uh, particularly those who do so into adulthood, uh, that we're really meeting those needs. And we know that as we work through uh, to support diverse communities, that it includes one of the huge elements uh, in order to be successful in that arena is to rely on strong community partnerships so you know just like any other uh, service system we can't do it alone and um, regional centers recognize the need to cooperate and collaborate with um, with community partners who really have an emphasis and uh, specialty in terms of service to certain diverse communities so with that, I'll be happy to take additional questions. Thanks so much, Amy. Um, the first question that we have uh, is, can you discuss the disparities in funding for different, different regional centers and what's being done to address the disparities? Sure. Um, so what I imagine the question is about is why when you look at, um, let me back up. Regional centers are required to post um, purchase of service data that's broken out by um, the number of individuals they support, uh, the race and ethnicity of those individuals, the language they speak, et cetera. And so um, I touched on just a moment ago what's being done to address uh, service to diverse communities. But I think this question has to do more with what's being done to address differences in purchase of service um, between regional centers. And again, it goes back to the, um, the individual program plan and what's required for each individual. Um, and it's really looked at in that way. And we also know that um, different regional centers have different demographics. Um, which may drive some service delivery. Uh, for instance, some regional centers support a population that is older than other regional centers. So there's a lot of nuance to this issue, um, but I always encourage people to look first and foremost at are the individuals that you love and care for um, being adequately supported to achieve their goals. Thank you. Um, and the next question we have is, what resources are available to assist families in planning for care for their loved one when they are no longer able to care for them? Great question. Um, so I think this is part of a bigger conversation. And I think, you know, when I was working directly with families, I always encouraged people to do a few things. I always encouraged them not to wait until it was a crisis. Um, to begin to think about those things. The, I would encourage people to consult with their uh, regional center service coordinator. There's also family groups um, that are open and available to discuss those issues. There's the Caregiver Resource Support Center. So there's a variety of uh, resources out there, but I can't stress enough the importance of future planning 
in advance of the anticipated need. Thank you. Um, someone else now asks, will there be additional hours allowed for out-of-home respite in 2018? Currently, it's limited to 21 days. Mm -hmm. Yes, the uh, cap on the, the statutory cap on the number of days of out-of-home respite is being eliminated, as is the statutory cap on the number of hours of respite services. Um, and in individual cases, it comes down to what is the individual need and ensuring that what each individual and their family or a caretaker needs um, is what their, that their need for respite that's determined on an individual basis is being met. Um, so it's not an automatic thing. It really ties back to um, showing that a need exists and um, the, the size of, or magnitude of that need. Thank you. Those are all the questions we have for this time. Fantastic. Well, I did want to um, leave you today with my contact information or the contact information for our office. Um, on this slide, you see our website as well as our phone number. And on our website, there is a link that says contact us and you can feel free to direct further questions uh, to us through that mechanism. And if there's no other questions. Uh, no, no questions right now, but thank okay. you for putting your information up. Of course. Um, so I'll go ahead and turn it back over to you, Sarah. Perfect. Thank you so much for that um, very thorough and informative presentation. And that brings us to a close for today. And I wanted to remind everyone to please take the short evaluation survey that you'll be emailed after the webinar is over. We really appreciate um, the feedback that you're able to give us. Um, thank you so much, everyone, and hope you all have a great day.